So today for you we have Treshek and Reshek and they are open source advocates and their talk today will be on their work with investigative journalism and sorry investigative journalists and supporting them to use open source software. Thank yep. you very much. Um, so hi everybody. I Hello. Think, uh, uh, I think it would be much better if we all moved a little bit closer. It'll be like it's a huge room, and, and apparently not many people here are, are interested in free software, which I understand. But if we're here, it will be easier for us if, if you're all, you know, closer. Presum presumably, you have some thoughts that we can, like, talk over a little bit in the Q&A. Uh, also, if you have any, like, questions, we can, uh, we can take care of them as we go. But there will be like, a fair amount of, of Q&A if you, if you guys have some suggestions about the talk. Yes. The more audience involvement, the better. This will be, you know, it's an open source talk. We should all kind just, of, you know. Just try not throwing things uh, yet. Okay. So, um, I am Ryszek and he is Czesiek, but uh, this will get lost anyway, so don't worry about it. Um, uh, we, are, uh, we are two hackers from, uh, from, um, from, well, originally from Poland, but now living in Sarajevo and doing weird shit. Uh, we are doing, we, we would like to talk about a little bit about how the free and open edge cuts uh, users, cuts people uh, that try to use it from time to time. Um, so, okay, whoops, uh, ah, there we go, that's a paper cut. This is not really there a paper cut. We'll explain okay. the difference in a minute. So, uh, so uh, these slides will be available on, on uh, or are available and on CC by SA 4, uh, 4.0, so just go crazy with it. And now, um, uh, as I said, we're hackers activists. We're in the business of organized crime and uh, high-level corruption. Um, if we have your attention now, uh, we work at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. It's a international NGO that does what it has in the name. We, we work with journalists, we work with uh, editors, reporters, um, and fact checkers, which are, surprisingly, they are non-techies, right? I mean, it's, it's not obvious that journalists are non-techies. Okay, it is obvious that they are non-techies, but they are non-techies. Um, and what the organization does is we're writing about stuff. Uh, that happens and how, I don't know, $20 billion got money laundered through Moldova or how a humble cellist from Russia has $2 billion um, in, in Panama. Uh, in Panama. Uh, of course, he's a friend of a certain Vladimir, but let's ignore that. Um, but back to the back to the topic. First, yeah, so our, our use case is very specific, but I believe there are there are many environments in which the same problems and the same like uh, paradigms apply. So we're working with IGE with journalists, but uh, I think there are groups of people that are just non-technical that are trying to use free software and have the same problems all over again. And so we're trying to, to talk more generally about those problems, but yeah, we're, we're going to use our examples because that's what we know. So, so here's, a, here's a disclaimer that was uh, suggested to us uh, by Bjarni, who's the developer of MailPile. If you don't know MailPile, you should totally check out MailPile. It's absolutely fucking amazing. Um, but, as, uh, but he suggested to us that we should make it clear that what we're going to do here we are not just trying to rant, right? There's going to be a couple of examples. There's going to be a couple of rants about how software makes it harder for users to use it um, for, for no good reason, right? There are some good reasons that, you know, there's some, sometimes there is complexity that has to be shown to the user, uh, i.e., you know, fingerprints or key fingerprints or key IDs in, in anything related to GPG or anything like that. But sometimes there are, so, so, there are small, stupid, annoying, like the sound, um, paper cuts that just make it really hard for, especially for non-techies to use software. And they, sh they are so easy to fix, but they never get fixed. So, uh, so we are, how, how many develop software developers we have here? Come on, don't be shy. I, 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 I can't believe it's just half of the room. Um, so many of us are software developers. Many of us are, are sysadmins. Many of us have their own uh, pet projects that uh, that also have those paper cut uh, bugs, right? Many of us write software that, I mean, 
if we write software, this software will have bugs. That's a, that's a given. But we very often don't have the time or energy or resources to fix all of the bugs. Right? This is like we're working um, uh, nights or we're, we're, uh, you know, we're working on our project as a, as a hobby project. Uh, and then we just don't have the time to, st to fix the stupid small bugs. We want to fix the bigger problems. We want to, I don't know, do the architectural stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And that is entirely fine. And we understand that because we have the same uh, problem. So the disclaimer is, please don't take this personally. Right? So, so we are not trying to shame the developers. This is not the point of this talk. The point of this talk is that we as a community seem to have um, uh, seem, to ha seem to value certain things at different levels. And this clashes with what the users need very often, right? We value, uh, we value um, technical amazingness, right? We, we love amazing stuff. Uh, we, we, we love right, uh, you know, to create amazing, sometimes complicated, sometimes overcomplicated systems that do something amazing, right? But then when we do the thing, the, the, the hard part, the, the thing that, was, that, that we had to figure out, then we leave out many of the details. We leave out the usability. We leave out fixing the small problems because this is not uh, sexy. And, and we, we try to, we, we'd like to try to tell you why this, is, um, why this is important. So the positive takeaway from all of this is that your software wants to be used, and probably there are people who want to re really hard want to use the software to solve their problem. And there you can't because the small problems that are obvious to us, how to solve them, are really unsurmountable. Like without, like without an option for for most of the people. Okay, so dear sir or madam, do you have a minute uh, <laughs> to talk about our Lord and Savior, free and uh, free Libra uh, open source software, um, or why don't NGOs use Floss? It seems like a no-brainer, right? You have an NGO or you have an association. You, know, you have a group of people doing something amazing, right? I don't know, fi fighting for uh, LGBTQ rights or, or fighting for privacy or fighting for anything, you name it, right? And, and it seems so obvious that they should be using free software, right? Why should they pay for, for software? Why should they get locked in into software? Why should they um, then uh, secondarily lock in their users or their supporters or their friends or people who communicate them into, into closed source um, um, stuff. So one of the reasons this happens, obviously, and I'm sure that this is not only uh, my experience, is our requirements that are you know, sent from somewhere above, like the government or the or organization that gives them a grant or anything like that, right? Sometimes there is something like that and there's nothing you can do. Sometimes it's a question of familiarity, right? You're a small NGO, uh, you're hiring uh, a person or you're, or you're actually, uh, you know, a, a volunteer comes in and help, tries to help you out, but th this person only knows the closed source, source uh, world, right? And it just doesn't make sense to, it seems like it just doesn't make sense to retrain them to use um, the free software solutions because this will take more time than they have to spend to help you out with the actual thing that you're doing, right? Um, there are many, many different reasons, but one of the reasons, as, as, as uh, our experience kind of showed to us, are small, annoying things like, uh, uh, that are called paper cuts. So who of you have ever heard about the, uh, the 100 paper cuts project of Ubuntu? Okay, we have some. Many, do we have any 100 paper cut developers here? No, no, no. Damn it, I would love to meet those people, wonderful people. So there's this project by Ubuntu, uh, within the Ubuntu community called 100 Paper Cuts. It was a little bit more, uh, uh, more well-known or, or a little bit louder about itself uh, a few years back. Now it's, now it's somewhere in the background, but it's still there. The idea is to fix those small, uh, those small annoying um, bugs that, that, bug, uh, that bug users. Um, so what's a paper cut? First of all, it's a bug. Right? It's not a feature. Um, secondly, it's simple or trivial to fix. It might be as simple as moving a button, uh, like switching, swapping the, uh, the, um, the order, like of, the of order of buttons yeah. on a form. Right? One famous paper cut, one of the, paper, the first 100 paper cuts that got um, fixed in, in Ubuntu was that some um, GTK uh, applications were using uh, cancel 
uh, apply uh, order, and some were using apply cancel, which meant that uh, you know if you if you just using your, if you're just using your muscle memory and you're using many of the first kind and the and less of the second kind, you might apply or cancel something randomly, right? You were you did not want to click here, but you just like you went for the bottom right corner, like oh shit. Damn it. OK, now I have to do it again. And now I have to remember that the buttons are swapped. Damn it. OK. Uh, so for us, uh, and they are annoying to the user, right? They're baking, uh, breaking their workflow or attention or anything like that, right? So for us, these things are simple to fix, it seems, right? We are techies. We are people who like, OK, well, I understand why this happened. I understand that you know somebody put the button on the wrong side of things. Or, or um, I understand that, uh, I don't know, something got missed or something got uh, like wasn't finished, or I understand that I have to click here. Uh, I have to go through this, these two additional clicks. But for a regular user, for a regular person that just tries to do their job, they're literally just trying to, you know, write a, um, a a ODT document, or they're trying to send an email, or they're trying to do something, and they're focused on this, and they're not techies, right? And then something weird happens that they don't expect, and they're taken out of the the, this, this flow, they're taken out of their focus, they, they lose their focus, and they have to focus on the software instead of the thing that they were doing. And if this keeps happening, if, if, they have to, if they have to do it every single time they send an email, for example, this takes a lot of their time and this takes a lot of their energy and creates a lot of frustration uh, for, uh, for those users. Also, sometimes it just scares them off. Sometimes it's not just annoying. Like annoying stuff is some, sounds like we're complaining about like this interface not being perfect. But this really has uh, has an effect of putting people off and and scaring them off. Sometimes we'll, we'll have one example that fortunately was fixed uh, in in the stash of examples. But they they tend to have sometimes an effect of just. Uh, stopping people from using the software at all. Like they, they, they may be annoying or they may be just uh, a catastrophe for, yeah. for the software. So what a paper cut is not, right? As I said, it's not a complex bug, right? It's not, it's not a, a, an, an actual, we would call it an actual bug, right? That, that you have to dive in, spend, I don't know, five days debugging, trying to figure out what the hell is actually happening in the software and, and, and then fix it, right? It's a simple thing. Um, this is usually not UI, uh, UI or UX design. I, I use this example of, of swapped button, uh, buttons. This is not a UI or UX. Uh, I mean, this is not a UI, UI design issue. It's just somebody put the buttons on the wrong, um, on, on the like on the wrong side, right? When I'm talking about UI and UX design, I'm talking about people actually sitting down and figuring what would be the best way to you to to do a certain task in software in general, right? Sitting down like like I don't know GNOME um, um, or GTK guidelines for writing software or anything like that, right? Fixing those guidelines, fixing the design side of things is super important, and this discussion is already happening, but this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about some things that are obvious that should be fixed, and then, they're, and then they're trivial to fix. Also, we're not talking, as I said, we're not talking about necessary complexity, right? We're not talking about situations where you actually, unfortunately, have to show something to the user and, and, and take the user out of the flow because the user, I don't know, has to verify a fingerprint, or, or the user has to scan a QR code or anything like that, right? There are better and worse ways of, fix, of, of, of dealing with those, but these are very often necessary and there's no way around them. And we're not talking about them, we're talking about things that, as I said, are trivial, obvious, um, um, and quick to fix. So, um, the question is, why won't you use Floss, right? Why won't you use um, free software? And from our our experience of working with, so the, the environment that we work in is really peculiar because on one hand, we, have, we work with about maybe 200 people all over the world. So sometimes we do help desk calls at 2 a.m. because eh, somebody's in Latin America and then they need help. But so on one hand, we, we kind of have to help those people stay safe. They have, we have to keep those people you know, from, from um, leaking uh, something uh, um, accidentally or using software that will leak them, uh, that for them. But on the other hand, we have no way of actually writing a policy that everyone will adhere to. Right? The only thing we can do is say, you know what? 
from our experience, this software is better than this. Right? From our experience or, or based on our, I don't know, knowledge, you should use this rather than that. For example, you should use, I don't know, Signal instead of Skype. Why do people use Skype? Okay, that's a rant. Um, so, so the question is, why, do, why, why don't people use uh, free and open source software? And we have no way of, of forcing them. We can just suggest it or, or ask them to. And so here's a scenario for you, right? So somebody is, needs to solve a problem. Somebody needs a software for, I don't know, uh, cutting PDFs into separate PDFs or, or merging PDFs. That's a, that's a use case that um, we've seen. And then <clears throat> we, find, we find some free software, uh, you know, free as in freedom, um, and we install it on their, on their Ubuntu or whatever, and they start using it, right? And we say, hey, so this is, like, from our perspective, this is better. This is free software, right? This, we, we don't have to manage licenses and other bullshit. Um, we can be actually sure what this does, right? If we have any, like, if, if, if we have any doubts that, you know, if something bad is happening, we can just check that. Um, and all the other reasons that us techies, like hackers, um, you know, free software activists, have been like, using as arguments for, for, for decades, right? Um, and then there's this small little thing, and the user sits down and, I don't know, tries to print, for example, right? And it doesn't, doesn't really work. You have to, I don't know, manually, you have to, for example, you have to always manually set the, the size of, of the paper. The software does not remember what size of paper you have, right? And then, it's like every single time, and the user works with PDFs, like with 200, 300 PDFs a day. And this becomes a problem. From our perspective, it's like, uh, why is this a problem? Just, just click on the you know, A4 or whatever, and, and, and just uh, it's done, right? But for the user, it's like there, there's this weird long-haired guy in a weird T-shirt that comes to the, into the office or writes an email and says, hey, use this software. And then this software is just annoying. And, and there's no good reason to use this software. Why should I use this software, right? So, so there's a disconnect between our motivations and, and our understanding of software, obviously, and, and, the, um, and the motivations and understanding of software and the needs of the users, right? And those small little paper cuts very often are, are things that actually stop users, uh, stop people from using free software, even though it might be better in the long run, even though it might be, you know, um, like it ha might have more features or, or uh, it might be, you know, more stable or anything like that, right? But there's this one single little annoying thing that this user has to click 300 times a day, and it just doesn't work, it, it just, because, just because there's too much, too much clicking I mean, um, there's, there's probably a command line flag to set that, so I wonder why they're not using that. But. <laughs> exactly. OK, so there's also something um, that I couldn't find a name for, so we kind of named it internally. Uh, we call it the Miranda Copout. Let's assume that the name is random. Um, so what is a Miranda Copout? Uh, tell me if you recognize this, right? Uh, somebody is using some kind of software for, let's say, audio and video calls, right? And, and you say, no, please don't use this software. This is not secure. This is not safe. This is, uh, uh, why? Just, just use this kind of, th this software. Like, this is better. This is open source. It was audited. It is secure. It is all of the things that this thing is not. And then this person, this user, starts using the software. And then there's one, the, the first little thing, the first little thing that is weird, or, or not even a bug, it's, it's, just, it's just different. Right? Immediately is the reason to drop the software. One, one of my favorite examples is like, oh, but it, the, the, the calls, the calls uh, you know, break from time to time. I'm like, OK, that's, um, that's cool. But do calls break on your old proprietary closed source shit? Yes. Do they break as often? Yes. Uh, so where's the problem? Right? The problem is that the user already has uh, decided that they want to go back, right? That they don't want to learn something new. It's, it's like we all have the same thing, right? We, we don't want to have the additional um, baggage of, of having to learn new tools or having to learn uh, new things if we have this one thing that we need to solve, right? And we know that there's software that does that. Uh, 
And for some reason, somebody tells us that we have to use something else, and it works differently. Right? Our brain will say, you know what, let's just find this little thing, that one little thing that we can use as an argument to go, to go back, and we'll go, we'll go back. It's the same thing with moving, back, moving from Windows to Linux, right? It's the same thing with moving from, I don't know, um, a proprietary um, office suit to, to LibreOffice, right? The buttons are on a different in a different place. These are, these are small, small things. Many of them are not paper cuts. But if you have, if you have a person who does the Miranda cop-out uh, on a regular basis, then paper cuts are the enabler. Right? They, will find, they will find this paper cut, and they will use it to say, I will not use this software. It is shit. That's an actual quote. Um, and, and, and then you're like, what, uh, well, how do I deal with this? Right? How do I even? Uh, try to convince the user if the user has already decided and they have this little thing, this one little thing. We know this is, it's a little thing, but they have it, right? They, they, they found it, this little argument, this little paper cut of theirs that, that they will now use against you. So, uh, by the way, do you have any questions? Because we tend to kind of start ranting, and I, as I said, I'd like to have some in engagement from the audience. So if you have any questions, or examples of yours, just raise a hand. OK. I want, yeah, the, the rant is very beautiful, but I wonder if we should move to examples a little bit because of the time constraints. There you go, sir. Yes. Uh, we have... Well, we, no. we have some annoying examples, and then we have some success stories, I guess. Yes. Uh, there's not a lot, but just to, just to illustrate the, the ranting. Huh? Uh -huh. I think I yes. have a paper cut. Nah, it's not. It's just steep learning curve of Linux. Oi, oi. Yes, there we go. Slideshows are hard. Why do you use KDE still? Uh, okay, I know what I'm going to do. Yay, there we go. Yay. Uh, Uh, yes. I think there was a good... No, wait. No. Jesus, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is an example. This is a very good example of paper cut, actually, right? So what is happening here, uh, we, have no way of, we had no way of testing this, this slideshow on a two-screen uh, set setup uh, when we were making this presentation. And it turns out that Gwenview, which is the KDE image, um, image uh, thing that I'm trying to use to show you the uh, the uh, uh, the examples that we have actually uh, made screenshots of assumes that hey you know what if you're if you're gonna do it full screen I'm just gonna use this screen no I want you to use no I'm gonna use this screen right there's <laughs> like I cannot find I cannot find a way to change that but we will work around that because we are uh, we are hackers and we have ways uh, which users usually do not have. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this. Uh, like, there is the software Enigmail, which you probably know, that works with Thunderbird. Uh, it's a um, it's a thing that enables uh, email encryption in Thunderbird, which is a Mozilla email email system. Um, so. When you're trying to send an encrypted email to someone, you have to have their public key. Um, the only way to, to get their public key if they didn't send it to you is to search for it on a key server. So you go into something in the menu that looks vaguely familiar. It's just a key. Uh, uh, yeah, key management. And, uh, and you click, and you're trying to search. But if you search, it really searches through your keys and not the keys on the key server. So it really doesn't do the thing that you want it to do uh, as, your, as your most usual thing. Uh, to, to get their key from the key server, you have to like, click somewhere and click search for keys. And then uh, it, can you, can you it go, go back two slides? Can you show the one? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, one, the, one, the next one. Right. This, thing, this thing I love. I, I, I totally love it, right? You have Enigma, uh, Enigma key management, you have search for, and then you have search for keys. What, what the hell was I searching for earlier? 
right? I mean, I understand this, Cheshek exactly. understands this, everything, everyone here understands what's happening on the screen. But if you ask a person uh, that is not a techie to, 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 to figure out how to get um, how to get uh, uh, a key from, from a key server, they were just like, uh, well, I, I don't know. If you went through the GPG tutorial like five times in your life and you remember what sub keys are and what are identities and how they differ from keys and all this stuff, uh, you're probably going to get around it, uh, like this interface. But if you're really new to email encryption, you're clueless and this will not help. Yeah. Uh, the the good thing is the um, uh, when you imported the key actually from a file or from a key server, it showed you this. It doesn't show you this anymore, fortunately, because if your if a user is trying to import a key, he, he or she really wants to see like a green uh, green arrow, like green. You're successful at importing the key, yes. and this happens, and you're. Uh, we, we, actually, we actually got help desk calls about this. Somebody imported a key, congratulations, well done. I mean, I'm not being sarcastic right now. Like, if somebody was able, if, somebody, if some non techie person was able to use Enigmail to import a key from a key server, I'm like, wow, would you like to work with us like, in, our, in our tech team? And then, and then we got a call about this weird alert box that showed up. Uh, apparently, something went wrong. I'm like, no, no, it didn't. What went wrong is that it's just like it's really bad. It's a really bad thing to show a, a thing like this to a regular user, because but this is a, scary. But it's an right? alert, and I don't know what HKP is, and what this, yeah. Uh, so fortunately, this was this was fixed. Now it looks like this, and and thank you, developers. Thank, thank you. you well done. I, let's have a round of applause for for Enigmail. No, honestly, <laughs> we 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 need these kinds of fixes in our daily lives. In in you know working with journalists. Um, yeah, this is this is just one one of the examples. The the other software we use for the same purpose because it's really hard apparently to get people to use encrypted email. Uh, is is Enigmail, which works with uh, Mailvelope, with with, uh, with uh, Mailvelope, which works with um, online mail systems, with yes, webmail. Web mail. Anybody uh, here used used Mailvelope or uses Mail uh, Mailvelope? Where is the uh, nobody. Okay. Okay. Then we have some. Users. So okay. it has some great things. Like if you have keys for people, it's auto completes and it's amazing. And uh, there are some usable parts. Uh, what happens when you're trying to add an attachment to an email is that you're looking for it and you find uh, it's not really visible at all. Uh, there is this small link uh, that says encrypt attachments. Um, it's kind of problematic. It gets you completely out of the flow. Uh, you click on it, uh, you're presented with something like this, which is a completely another view and you're wondering at this point what ha what happens uh, it asks you to add the files uh, so you add the files uh, when so you're right done now, adding right the now, files by, by now you've, you've forgotten why were you even doing this and, right? and where's the email like what I was writing yeah. about what you've, I wanted to you, you vaguely remember that you're writing an email but now you're in some different thing and you're some different flow and you don't know what's what's going on uh, you added the files, so you, you, you succeeded in picking the files, which, which will, would, be, would have been easier. So now it's asking you about the recipient of your message, because you typed that in before, but now you have to like, choose them again. So you have to remember to add the recipients two or three times if you're sending an encrypted email, right? You have to add the recep recipients to the to field, or BCC or CC, whatever, and then you have to add them to encrypt to in in uh, in Mailvelope, uh, you know the text editor uh, edit window, and then you have to add them again if you're encrypting an attachment. Yes. Also, also, uh, I didn't check it. Like, I, I don't know it for sure, but I'm pretty sure that if you want to be able to decrypt the attachment later on, you have to add yourself to this list. Because yeah, that's that's how it works. And then uh, it asks you to download the encrypted file. And then you have to attach it to the original message in the original window. Um, yeah. yeah, this is like an example of something that maybe so, so there are techn technological reasons, but we can prevail. We can yeah. like work around them, and this doesn't make any sense. Also, you will not de delete the, the attachments that you saved on your disk to add them to your message 
which creates another level of complexity and another actually threats if you're sending sensitive files you don't want to have them in five copies on the disk somewhere even if they're encrypted so uh, why there's, why a there's a few more but i think we're running short yeah, on yeah, time we're, we're so running we short, short, of, to the short on time so i'm going i'm going to give you three more uh, just by saying them right uh, and these are kind of my uh, my favorites one of them also fixed ea for signal developers is that you couldn't send attachments other than media, like uh, videos or, or images, etc. So you couldn't send a text document or a PDF or anything like that through Signal for some reason. Right? Now, that, now this is fixed, but for, for a year, this was a huge problem for us because we have journalists and, and, so, and their sources, they're communicating with, through Signal, thank God, right? But, but then they cannot send attachments through it. They have to find a different way, I don't know, somehow to, find, to, to send a PDF, right? That was a huge problem, right? It, it got fixed, thank God. Um, second, one, second one is something that I'm hit every single day with. It's who uses K-Mail, KDE PIM? Um, nobody uses K-Mail. Good, stay that way. Um, but but I'm, I'm kind of sucked into this software. And what happens is that there's a special key combination to send email, right? You're writing an email, and then it's like control enter or something like that. And it li literally says, send email now. So I'm, I'm hitting this, and then I'm sh shown a, a dialog box. Do you want to send email now? Like, yes, this is exactly what I just did. Like, I literally told you to send email now. Why are you asking me this again, right? And I sent a fair amount of emails every day. And I know that for, for a regular user, this would, be, this, would be, you know, this would be killing, because it's like 200 additional clicks every single day. Um, and the third one is um, Ubuntu. If you have uh, full disk encryption on Ubuntu, you, of course, have the unencrypted boot um, uh, partition. Right? For some reason, Ubuntu makes it uh, uh, 512 megabytes, but the kernel package is about 100 something megabytes. So every like after five, uh, four to five uh, up uh, kernel upgrades, uh, we get calls from users saying uh, there's something about you know uh, uh, not enough space on the hard drive. And then we are like, oh, fuck, right, the, the boot thing. So it doesn't remove old kernels, and it makes it very small uh, to begin with. And that's something, uh, that's something we also have to, uh, have to remember. But so the question is, why does this happen? And I, I'm, uh, we decided to call this the uncanny valley of paper cuts. There are bugs that are sexy. Right? There are like, ooh, this is an interesting bug. I'm going to spend two days or five days debugging this, and then because I'm going to learn something new, or, or, or because it's, it's a challenge, right? Paper cuts are not this, right? Um, on the other hand, they are, there are bugs that are boring, but they're high stakes, right? There's like, yeah, if, if this bug doesn't get fixed, it's, it's incredi incredibly boring, but if this bug doesn't uh, get fixed, um, uh, nobody can use our software, right? And paper cuts are somewhere in between. They're not as high stakes as a serious huge bug that doesn't, I don't know, that blocks you from encrypting the email at all, right? But they're not as sexy as actually figuring out how to do X, Y, and Z. It's literally a small, annoying thing that, you know, you can actually click around usually, right? And, and somehow, we as a community, and again, as I said, we're not trying to blame the developers, right? We have the same problem. We have the problem of limited resources and limited time and et cetera, et cetera. But I think the, the broader question is, can we as a community find a way to, to make paper cuts valuable to fix, right? To make paper cuts maybe not sexy. There will never be sexy, right? But maybe, maybe we can find a way of telling the developers, we really appreciate the fact that you are fixing those small bugs apart from the large bugs that are, that, that are there, right? And apart from adding features, right? Somehow we need to kind of channel this, this good energy towards the people that are actually fixing, uh, uh, fixing this, this, those small paper cuts, because these are really as annoying, as, as, as weird as it may sound, these are things that actually keep uh, users from, from uh, using free software. Um, and, and here's a, a short message again from, from our good friend Bjarni, who, uh, as I said, wrote, uh, is, is creating MailPile. He, he made a very good point yesterday, um, um, which, uh, which we decided to include here. We are magicians, right? We, hackers, developers, etc. we are magicians. 
if we write software that, that is used by 10,000 or 100,000 or 1 million people, we might not even know that it's being used by so many people, right? But every hour we spend on this software, if you divide it by, by a million people, that's infinitesimal, infinitesimally small, right? It's incredibly small. Uh, uh, how much effort it takes to fix a bug for, a, for, a, or for an individual user, right? But the time that we can save and the, and, the, um, and the empowerment that we can give to the users is incredible. It's, it's, it's tremendous, right? It's magnificent. One hour of developer time uh, for a software that is being used wild, uh, like widely is incredibly valuable because of the time of the users that is being saved, because of the empowerment, because of the features that the users get, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So kind of let's think of us as, as magicians. We have those magic wands. We have those magic keyboards. We can, we can literally make somebody's life better. And it's not just one individual person. It might be millions of people or thousands of people or hundreds of, of uh, organizations that are actually working every day to make this, this world a better, um, a better place. Especially if we, if we focus on the paper cuts, because like, this is the biggest leverage that we have. We can spend 15 minutes fixing an annoying bug that takes an hour or two hours out of someone's life every day. And this scales for 500,000 people. It's, so the, it's the 80-20 yeah. <laughs> rule, right? We spend 80% of our time helping users fix the 20% of this, this, those smallest, those most trivial problems that they, they, they have with, uh, uh, with software. Um, OK, so where's the? there we go. So keep calm and, and fix paper cuts, um, I guess. Uh, do you have any questions? Because we would like to have questions. Are there any questions? Or now is the time that you can start throwing things at us. I mean. Silence. We put everyone to sleep. Nobody's interested. OK, well, uh, okay. so ha there was, is there a question? No. Uh, so we're going to keep ranting about this so, anyways. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask a uh, different question. Has anyone of you, uh, well, I'm sure you have, but the question is, can we, can we remember? Give me an example of a paper cut that you have uh, encountered in software you use daily. Because many of those examples were from, from our daily use, right? The k thing is from my, my, literally my daily use. And it took me a moment to actually understand this is a paper cut, right? That, that this is like, it's not normal to have to do the same thing twice to send an email, right? Uh, yes, please. I have an issue that has nothing to do with open source, actually. It, it's, uh, but it's something that you see a lot in computer games. Mm -hmm. uh, commercial, uh, expensive uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 computer games. First you start the launcher, then the launcher starts the game, then you play the game, then you quit, you get to the center menu, and from the center menu you have to quit again. You have, I always have to click two to four times to quit the game. It's, it's it's, and, 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 and I know two should be the maximum. Why not just one? It's also there are some games where you during the game you can't load a different game. You have to um, um, you, you have to quit, get to a main menu, and then you can load again. Everything takes more steps than necessary, and it's it's, and it's super annoying, especially if you're playing the game at work, right? And the boss comes by and you want to quit quickly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I play games only at home, but, uh, <laughs> but, okay. but it, it's it. It, it, it's a small thing, and I keep running into it in, in almost every game. And, it's, and I, I think, why, don't, why is this such a standard in, 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 in game development? Yep. Any, anybody else? Any other paper cuts? No, no paper cuts? Come on. You all have you all been cut by a paper cut. So, OK, a different, a different question. Yeah, OK, sorry. So, so speaking about games, uh, one of the biggest pet peeve of mine is uh, you can't really uh, alt-tab out of most Linux games, uh, which for, for a platform that wants to encourage people to game, um, it, it's very difficult to move from Windows to, to Linux and then try to play something, alt-tab to your browser while you're doing something, and then not being able to do anything because you lost your mouse or you can't, literally can't alt-tab. <laughs> and yep. it seems like a very easy solution well, a very small paper cut that someone can deal with, but yeah. it keeps showing up over and over again in all the games. <laughs> yep. 
Uh, okay, so a different question. Does anyone have any suggestions how we could fix the paper cuts? How we could fix the community or fix the community, change the community in a way that we could um, kind of channel this good energy towards developers to fix the paper cuts? Yes. Not exactly actually about the paper cuts, but in, in the Miranda Copout example, you uh, said something about people refusing to use the software, not just by paper cuts, but just by uh, yeah. different. Uh, Differences. Um, can you tell something more about the psychology behind uh, enticing users to use false software? Uh, sure. So, so the, we were surprised, and we are still surprised uh, by the fact that. Um, so, for example, journalists. As I said, journalists are not very technical usually, unless we're talking about technical journalists. But these are, these are not the ones that we're working with. Um, but they're an ama amazingly intelligent people, and they, they, they go through this long process of, of you know, education and then uh, internships and then more internships and then you know, uh, getting, getting actually good at journalism, right? And part of that process is, like, at every step of this process, one thing is made super clear, super important to them, and that is they have to protect the sources. Protecting the sources is the most important thing they have to do. Like, for the first thing is they have to protect the, the sources. The next thing is that they may, might maybe publish something one day, right? Uh, which, which, which is an amazing, amazingly good thing. Uh, but since they are not, and they have very good, um, uh, so they have surprisingly good tools to deal with that in real life, right? So they know, for example, that they have to take out the battery from, from, from a phone, or they know that when they're going to meet a source, they should make sure that uh, like, they're not being followed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But because they're not techies, because they're not technically inclined uh, people, and because we do not have you know, media compet competences uh, um, in schools, which pay perhaps we should fix, uh, they cannot kind of move this, um, this experience, this, this knowledge uh, from quote unquote real world into the digital world, right? So one thing that works amazingly well with journalists is making the analogy, right? Creating the, anal uh, the metaphor for them, right? Saying, okay, so you, you're talking to your source. If you're, if you're not using an encryption, then basically you're shouting through, like, through a room to the source that is standing there. Everybody knows who the source is, and everybody knows who, what, what you're saying and what the source is saying. And then immediately it clicks. It's like, oh, okay. And then their OPSEC is immediately better, and they're immediately starting to use, to use the... Um, the, the software. So I guess the answer is you have to find something that moves a particular user, right? For the journalists, it's protecting the sources. It's, it's super important, and, and this is non-negotiable for them, right? So, okay, that's something we can use, right? Um, explaining. Uh, not just saying use this, but saying, so, so this is what happens, blah, 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 something or other, and this is, like, this is the broader picture. I don't know. NSA is spying on everyone on the internets. Um, that's why we need to encrypt stuff. That's why we need to use this software. That's why this software is better than that, that software, right? And even if they, do, they are not able to uh, remember everything, just as I would not be able to remember everything if they told me why certain things in journalism are more important than others, they will remember that there is an explanation. And if they need the explanation, they will come, come to you again. It is, it is suddenly not just a random rule that somebody imposes on them. It's, it's suddenly you know, understandable and, and, and potentially helpful. And so, yep, thanks for, thanks for the question. So, any, any ideas how we can fix the paper cuts? One thing, one thing that I came up with is um, starting to tag the, tag the bugs. If we're, uh, Hi. So, um, I just wanted to add, uh, it's not only paper cuts that um, make people avoid free and open software. It's also a networking effect. It's like yes. you, you say the, your, your video conference application. Why do people use it? Well, because everybody else is already using it. And it's like yes. when you say, well, use this, but my friends are not there. Yes. Or like no, no. The, the nobody network, else uses it. The network effect is incredibly uh, potent and incredibly important. And, and this is why people still use Skype, unfortunately, even though they know that it's what it is. Um, but uh, but right, like right here, we just wanted to focus on, uh, on, on paper cuts, right? Just one, one slice of the cake. Yes. Um, there's another, uh, I'm suddenly reminded of a talk I heard years ago at ApacheCon. Um, uh, uh, Stephen Pemberton, a member of the, a Dutch member of the uh, uh, W3C, 
uh, had a keynote where he where he uh, said that the problem with open source uh, software. Sorry. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it up a bit. Oh, this sounds very different. Okay. Um, he said that the big problem with um, uh, open source versus uh, commercial software is that commercial software is um, it's written uh, uh, to sell. It has to appeal to the user, to the customer who pay money. So you have to conquer the users. Most hackers, most open source developers, they write software mostly for themselves. They have a problem. Yeah. They need the problem fixed. So they fix it in a way that works for them. Yes. And if that means that the interface is complex, arcane, that's not a big deal because they're used to that. Yeah. And, 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 and the, the big problem is that open source developers will have to think in a more commercial way, uh, uh, see, uh, an, analyze the little things, the paper cuts that, yeah. that, 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 uh, that, don't, that, that are not a problem to them, but are still a problem to other people and just yeah, you know, make it easier, slicker, polish it. Yeah. Make it look more like commercial software, which might be a bit, um, uh, 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 might feel a bit dirty for people, for, for, for hackers who like, who like it rough. And, GPL and, and, doesn't and say anything about selling software. What? Open source, I mean, free software can be commercial. It, right? can, it, 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 it can be, but, yeah. but because it's also often available for free, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not commercialized in the same way. So and and, 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 and in a way, we don't want that's that. It's such a great topic, but these guys have just got to wrap up. So yeah, one minute. Okay, so, so I guess one more question. Um, so one thing you can do is uh, try to build up the, um, the network of usability uh, designers, because uh, yeah. recently there's been this upsurge of, of people who specialize in UX uh, development and stuff like that. And uh, they're becoming more and more uh, in tune with open source. And I know this is a bit dirty, but there's a lot of people who do no, JavaScript stuff, uh, usability in, in JavaScript and web. And if we can bring them to have a look at our software uh, at the and open cry. Source, yeah, um, that would be great, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who can easily mock up the, uh, the, their designs. Yeah. But it's just getting them into the projects that's the, the biggest issue. Yeah, so I, so I think this is, I mean, what I said is, uh, earlier is that this is already happening. I remember on CCC uh, last year and CCC two years ago, there was a whole room for, for um, open source designers. Like open source designers were just sitting there and saying, hey, just come to us and we will help you to you know, mock up the application or tell you why this particular the decision, you know, UI, UI UX decision is, is a problem. But as I said, we we're not talking about UI UX here, even though most of our examples were, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, but the, 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 the problem with the paper cuts is that, so with the design, you can have this wonderful design, et cetera, et cetera, and still have the paper cuts somewhere, right? And they will still not get fixed because they are not sexy. Creating the design is sexy. Creating paper cuts, uh, fixing paper cuts is not sexy. One last sentence, promise. So I'll just f finish the thought from earlier. One of the th ways I, I kind of came up with, but everyone would have to kind of get involved, is to tag bugs that you, uh, that you report on, on you know, which, whichever software you're using as a paper cut. So that's clear, it's easy to find how many paper cuts are where. And it's easy to, to, to show, oh, these developers are actually fix fixing the paper cuts. Thank you, right? Then, then we can have, then we can have uh, a ways of showing, yes, these, these guys are amazing. They're not only doing, making, you know, creating amazing software, but they're also fixing the paper cuts even though they're not sexy. And then we can thank them. But there have to be better ways. Absolutely. And thanks for ending on such a practical example. Thank you Thank very you. much.